Hello and good Wednesday evening to you. We're grateful for you. We're thankful for you taking the time to watch tonight. We do miss being with everyone in person tonight, but we're praying for safety and warmth for everyone in your homes. And please let us know if we can be of assistance to you during the course of this weather. We pray that it's now the most of it is behind us, that things begin to thaw out and dry up over the next day or two. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 17 tonight. Matthew 17. We're going to begin in verse number 14. Matthew 17. We'll begin in the text that starts in verse 14. The biggest factor in whether or not we could see the moon, say looking out of our houses tonight, is not the size of the window. You could indeed see the moon with the smallest possible window imagined if that window is facing in the direction of the moon. Likewise, you could miss the moon altogether with the biggest set of windows, maybe even a full wall of glass, if that wall, if that window is facing in a direction away from the moon. See, the size is really less important than the direction. One author uses that illustration to talk about what's happening in Matthew 17, beginning in verse number 14. The faith of the disciples is being challenged by Jesus. And at first listen, it might sound as though he's correcting the size of their faith. But as he concludes his statement to them, he's going to show them It's really about the direction of their faith. And do they truly trust God most? Matthew 17, it's important to remember that Jesus and the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, have come down off the mountain from that transfiguration experience. That opens the chapter. And you'll remember that the disciples see Jesus changed, transfigured, and they see him with Elijah and Moses. And that voice from above, from the Father, corrects Peter. Jesus is not on their level, the same level of Elijah and Moses. Jesus is greater than them. Listen to him. Hear him. Hear him alone. Well, as they're on the mountain, you've got a crowd forming at the base of the mountain seeking Jesus. And you've got the other nine disciples among the crowd. That sets the stage for what happens beginning in verse number 14. Apparently, One of the crowd members was this dad who's brought his son to be healed by them, and they could not heal him while Jesus was on the mountain. So let's listen to what we're told, Matthew 17, beginning verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly, for often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Some older translations include a verse 21 here that's paralleled generally in Mark's account, Mark chapter 9, verse 21. This kind never comes out except by prayer and fasting. So what observations can we make from this text and learn tonight? Number one, notice the starting point here, helplessness. Helplessness is the starting point of faith. See, demons in the first century during the time of Jesus, they made life miserable, they made life dangerous for those whom they inhabited, and also made life miserable for those around them. The dad even emphasizes that his young boy is suffering terribly. We need to remember that the devil and his forces do not care about what we think of as fairness. 
They will use any angle or any vulnerability against us. This is a good time for us in this text to remind, remind ourselves of the helplessness of sin. Do you remember that helplessness? Helplessness caused by sin. Knowledge that this is against the purity, the holiness, the character of God. That it rejects His love toward you. Do you remember the pain caused by sin? Its consequences. How it impacts others around you. See, faith starts when we turn to God because we learn He is the only one we can trust. We turn to God because we've learned firsthand that our own ways are costly. They're costly to our own lives now, and they're costly to our souls eternally. Now, this is a vital principle for any generation. That's the point Jesus is going to make in the verses that follow. But we especially need to keep remembering this and this sense of helplessness that sin causes the more we experience success and comforts in this life. Have you heard of the term trust fund baby or trust fund generation? I've, I've been reminded of that phrase this past week because I've heard someone in talking about the Alabama coaching transition that's underway from Saban now to Coach DeBoer. He said it's going to challenge a lot of fans because they are, quote, trust fund fans. He's saying they've never known anything but success and dominance. So they're going to have to readjust their their expectations, and understand what's possible. Well, when we have a trust fund generation that thinks that success is guaranteed, that thinks that they deserve anything they want, when I have a culture that thinks, well, I've always gotten my way, so when I don't get my way, I'll throw a fit, I'll complain, I'll blame, I'll, I'll make life miserable on someone else until I get what I want. When we, approach, when we begin to approach God that way, when we begin to approach the church that way, we would begin to approach our faithfulness to God that way, then we're setting ourselves up for disappointment completely. We cannot expect for God to simply arise and do everything that we think we want. God has never operated that way. He doesn't operate that way today, and He will never operate that way. What we might call postmodernism, we so often see connections to selfishness. It's a result of selfishness. Well, you got to keep remembering that any of those forms of selfishness are rooted in a fear or an insecurity that refuses to turn to God for help and thus turns against God. So helplessness is the starting point for faith. But now go back to chapter 17 and verse 18 and remember that no one has fully arrived. Everyone has room to keep growing. Jesus told them, verse 17, you're a faithless and twisted generation. I'm with you now, he's saying, but there will come a time he knows that he will no longer be with them. So Jesus rebukes the demon and the demon comes out of the boy. So the disciples, despite having been given the power to cast demons out, despite having walked with Jesus and learned from Jesus, they still had much room to grow in the exercise of their faith. Jesus calls them faithless and twisted, unbelieving and perverse, your translation may say. The second adjective in this list of two is dependent upon the first. See, they were perverted or twisted because they were first unbelieving. Whatever trust they had was not aimed in the right direction, even while they were doing something God had told them to do, which was to cast these demons out. So this shows just how highly he views our trust and submission to Him. There is a fundamental difference in coming to Him because we trust Him completely compared to coming to Him because we think He can add something to our already comfortable and busy lives. See, they'd been given the power to cast out demons in chapter 10, and for some reason they'd grown comfortable with that power. Perhaps they thought they were the ones that were causing the demons to leave that the demons were for some reason afraid of them as disciples. Perhaps they didn't think that it was necessary to consult with God and to pray to God because they had this habit and this pattern of casting out demons before. We're not told the specific thinking they had other than Jesus tells them it's misdirected thinking. 
It's unbelieving. It's perverted thinking. It was rooted in not having a trust in God to provide. Then as we close out the text, we're reminded of a third principle, that deeper trust is always going to be the starting point for growth. No one's arrived. No matter the years that we have been in Christ as a Christian, and no matter our spiritual heritage in our families, no matter where we're at, we always have more room to grow. No one has arrived. The answer to that is that deeper trust is always going to be the starting point for more growth, future growth. The disciples pull Jesus aside in verse number 19. They they wonder, why couldn't we have cast it out? And Jesus says, because of your little faith. And that's where we would do well to, to see the meaning behind the meaning. Little faith is one of the best ways to translate this, but the meaning is not size. The meaning is depth. You have a shallow faith. You have a faith that is impoverished, that's poor. It's not full of the right substance. Because then he goes on to explain what he means. I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed. Well, that's the smallest of seeds that they knew in their time. So Jesus is not saying that they had a small faith, but it was in God. He's saying that no matter what faith you had in that moment, it was somewhere else. It was impoverished of true, deep trust in God. Their trust was not in the power of God. It was not to the level of God's power and possibilities. So the more we trust in ourselves, the more we're naturally shifting away from the power of God. Do we see that in the opening illustration of seeing the moon? That no matter how small the window might be, when we're in the right direction, we can always see the moon. But no matter how big the window can be, we can never see the moon if it's in the wrong direction. Well, likewise, the more we trust in ourselves, no matter how big the window of our own performance gets, if we're away from God, we're away from His power. So the takeaway in wanting to to see that faith that moves mountains is that we will draw ourselves nearer to the will of God. We beg Him then for strength to carry His will out. And so even when there are things that God would have us to do and provides us opportunities to do, when they appear to be like moving mountains, He still makes them possible. We only access that possibility and that power by fully turning toward Him. Proverbs 28, verse 26, Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. He who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Psalm 62, verse 8, Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. See the connection there? How will we know if we're trusting Him at all times? How will He truly be a refuge to us? Look at the middle clause. When we are actively pouring out our heart before Him. Then Proverbs 3. 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. Now, while these three verses remain as some of the most quoted and referenced scriptures, I hope we understand just how difficult they are to implement. Jesus could have easily quoted those three verses to disciples there at the bottom of the mountain following the transfiguration. When we hear these familiar words from Proverbs 3, what's our first first reaction? Do we think, well, yeah, of course, but, but I'm doing that already. If that's our first reaction, that's a red flag. That's a red flag that we might not fully understand the depths of what it means to trust Him, to trust Him most, to trust Him deeply. So we move toward an application tonight in our time together. What are two or three things right now that you think are impossible or near impossible or highly unlikely? Maybe they're habits or decisions, circumstances to endure, uncertainties you're afraid might happen. Perhaps it's overcoming a specific sin in your life a habit to break, a habit to change, a new habit to commit to? Are there people you know you need to love and serve more deeply? 
when we can identify those two or three areas right now, put them on paper, write them down, type them in a note in our phone, then follow this process. Pray deeply. Pray deeply and with focus to trust God. See, when we start with our own fleshly assumptions first, we're limiting our trust in God. So start completely and openly with Him, but don't let it stop there. Pray deeply and pray with focus to trust in God, but then seek the will of God to know what He says about it. That order is specific and important. If we start with knowledge, and we just start assuming that, oh, okay, I'll probably do what I read, then we're setting ourselves up to find resistance and excuses for what we find in the will of God. So pray deeply to trust in God. And using that trust, then seek the will of God in those areas that you identified. And then follow that up with prayer again to trust Him fully to put what He said into practice. What if that was the process for how we read and study the Bible every day? I pray to trust you more fully. I read and I study to see more clearly what your will is. And then I pray for strength and trust to carry it out. We want to have true faith. True faith and trust in the direction of God and His great power because of His great love. We're going to close in prayer. We're going to mention by name those that we've been mentioning uh, since Sunday. And uh, maybe the one main update since Sunday is to remember the family of Katrinka Yules. That's the niece of Peggy Wade. She passed away Sunday night, I believe. And so her funeral services, I believe, are supposed to be this coming Sunday. But that's the niece of Peggy Wade, Katrinka Yules. Let's pray together, and I'll type these up and send them out in email and into the, the private Facebook group also. But let's reach out to one another in the midst of the weather, but also just with so many who are at home sick and struggling. Let's take care of each other in the Lord. Let's pray. Dear God and Father, we thank you for the beauty of today. We do thank you for the beautiful scenes that we've been able to experience because of the winter weather. And we thank you for keeping our number safe. And we pray that you'll help us to stay home and stay safe and stay, stay warm. And we do pray that you'll help us to, to keep writing this out over the next few days. We thank you for time to study from your word. We thank you for how Jesus challenges us to deeper faith and truer faith. Help us to orient ourselves in your direction and to stop striving for personal success, stop striving for self-ambition, but instead turning to you in humility, falling before you. We're thankful so much for the promise and the power you have given us to move mountains when we do trust you and desire most to carry out your will. Forgive us for so often having an empty faith, a self-trusting orientation instead of a humble orientation toward you. We have so many whom we're concerned about tonight. Uh, we pray for those that, that need help in the midst of the weather. We pray that we can be a source of help for those that we might know about, and, and we pray that we can find help, however, uh, for them. We also pray for families who've lost loved ones. Family of Brother Hugh Plyler, bless uh, Wayne and, and Hugh's grandchildren and great-grandchildren, the rest of his family. Pray for the family of Katrinka Yules, that's the niece of Peggy Wade. Uh, bless all of them. We pray for many who are at home sick, Miss Ann Pugh, Don Guthrie, Cruz and Cross, McCamey, Sandra Byharry, Kathy Graves, uh, Danny Burnett recovering from his fall. Pray for Stacy uh, Wasilevich, the niece of Judy and Wheeler. For Phyllis the Priest, the sister of Winona Sides, for Miss Stella Wade, Rick's mom, for Tim Parker, the son of Barbara, the brother of Tammy, for Bill Blanton, the brother of Brenda Kemp. There are others who need us and who need you. We pray that you'll bless and help them tonight. Help us this night to rest in you. Give us a great week, rest of the week in your service, and bless us on the first day of this new week ahead as we meet together on Sunday. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.